This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Welcome everyone to Too Good To Be True, and thank you to all the listeners. Are you ready for a really surprising show about near-death experiences? Before we start getting into details, let's just briefly talk about psychic insight and how we apply it. We choose a subject, then research it, and based on that research, we determine what we think needs to be explained by creating a series of questions. Then Justina provides psychic insight to answer those questions. At the end of the process, we have psychic insight into a subject. At that point, it is a question of individual belief. Now let's go through the disclaimers. Here are the disclaimers. Neither of us claim to have any expertise in any of the subjects that we discuss. We relate information we find through research in the Psychic Insight. We are always delighted to hear from the listeners. The show only lasts an hour. We don't have the time to present exhaustive research on any topic. This means that there will be information that we miss. We want to provide a basis for the Psychic Insight. We don't care if a theory turns out too good to be true, as the show name suggests. We are only interested in finding out more of the truth about topics. Spirit can only relate insight that is appropriate for our time in history. Free will cannot be affected. Only comments that are appropriate for our time can be given through the psychic insight. Much of the subject matter in shows will have already been covered again and again in other shows. We want to look into the subjects in a new, different way and be thought-provoking. We are not so good with pronouncing names, and we apologize. Finally, different people believe different things about life and whether there is an afterlife. We understand that some of the following content may conflict with individual beliefs. We respect everyone's personal beliefs. Thank you, Justina. We're going to talk about near-death experiences. Why did you suggest the subject? Because I saw a video on YouTube featuring clinical psychologist Dr. Kathy Forty. She claims she had a near-death experience. She also claims during her experience that she learned how key mathematical information affects consciousness. Kathy Forty is obviously highly intelligent and highly articulate, which adds credibility to her story. I would not expect that a clinical psychologist would have much to gain by going public with a paranormal experience. Clinical psychology is firmly based in the world of science. Cynics may say that her, herself, needs a clinical psychologist. Why don't you give an overview of near-death experiences? Then we can look at some examples. I looked up near-death experiences, experience-related television programs to find a series I used to watch. The website neardeath.com has a list of 92 of them, which seems unbelievable. Shows listed include those shown on major networks. The series I was thinking about was I Survived Beyond the Back, which was shown on the Biography Channel from 2011. The series didn't last that long, but I think that the similarities in the stories meant that the content soon became repetitive, even though each episode was pretty incredible. Going by the number of television shows, near-death experiences must happen reasonably often. We only hear about the stories people are prepared to talk about. There must be stories that are not made public. But what is a near-death experience? I know you like to find a definition for any subject, so why don't you provide one? Yes, the term was used first in 1975 in the book Life After Life by Raymond Moody, MD. The book, which has sold 14 million copies, is a study of people who have experienced near-death experiences. But regarding definitions, Dictionary.com has the following, and I'll quote, a sensation or vision as of the afterlife reported by a person who has come close to death, unquote. Sometimes there are claims that subjects are actually clinically dead before they return. In simple terms, clini- clinically dead means that breathing has stopped. Before looking at some examples, what does conventional science have to say on the subject? 
Scientific American has an entire website dedicated to the subject dated September 2011. Here is a brief quote from the website. Seeing your life pass before you and the light at the end of the tunnel can be explained by new research on abnormal functioning of dopamine and oxygen flow. Dopamine in the brain functions as a neurotransmitter, a chemical released by nerve cells to send signals to other nerve cells. Why don't you provide the major point of the article? It refers to a British journal. Yes, the quote is as follows. Um, quote, recently a host of studies has revealed potential underpinnings for all the elements of such experiences. Many of the phenomena associated with near-death experiences can be biologically explained, says neuroscientist Dean Mobbs at the University of Cambridge's Medical Research Council Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit. Mobbs and Caroline Watt at the University of Edinburgh detailed this research online on August the 17th in Trends in Cognitive Sciences. We have to be careful here. Scientific, Amer Scientific American and the reference article do not appear to be saying that all near-death experiences are false. They're saying that there are biological explanations for many aspects of reported experiences. Possibly some of the near-death experiences are rooted in biology, while, uh, while others cannot be explained by what is currently understood in biology. There is some scientific proof that the afterlife is possible. However, this does not prove or disprove that the afterlife is true. It's just a possibility. But let's get into this and more information about near-death experiences after this break. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Welcome back to Too Good to Be True. And before the break, we were talking about near-death experiences. And I think this is a very important point. So I'm going to repeat what I just was talking about. There is possible scientific proof that the afterlife is possible. However, this does not prove or disprove that the afterlife is true. It's just a possibility. This came up on another show as an Edgar Casey prophecy that came true. We quoted that quantum mechanics does not rule out the possibility of an afterlife or the survival of brain function after death. We mentioned the name of theoretical physicist David Bohm. However, the proof in theoretical physicists is in the use of math. So, to truly understand the proof, you need to understand the math, which most of us don't. Recently, another scientist has been in some far-reaching newspaper articles in Great Britain. British scientist Roger Penrose suggests that humans have souls which don't die along with the body. Consciousness is just a packet of information stored at a quantum or subatomic level. Sir Roger has argued that when a person dies temporarily, 
this quantum information is released into the universe only to return to the body's cells if the host is brought back to life. Sir Roger also claims to have found evidence that information stored in microtubules within human cells leaves the body after a person dies. The following quote, the following is a quote from Sir Roger Penrose from the Sun newspaper on November the 5th, 2016. Quote, if the patient dies, it's possible that this quantum information can exist outside the body, perhaps indefinitely as a soul, unquote. Apparently, this theory is backed by, the, by researchers at the renowned Max Planck Institute for Physics in Munich, Germany. Let's now look at the work of Dr. Bruce Grayson, Professor Emirates of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Science at the University of Virginia. Dr. Grayson is a co-author of the book Irreducible Mind, published in 2007. The lead author, Dr. Edward Kelly, is a professor at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Irreducible Mind depicts the mind as being an entity independent of the brain or body with the mind surviving the body after death. The Grayson scale, developed by Grayson, measures the depth of an individual's near-death experience with scoring for 16 questions. Here are two example questions with scoring. Example question. Did you suddenly seem to understand everything? Zero equals no. One equals everything about myself or others. Two equals everything about the universe. Another example question. Did you seem to enter some other unearthly world? Zero equals no. One equals some unfamiliar and strange place. And two equals a clearly mystical un or unearthly realm. A score of seven or greater identifies an experience as near death. If the mind is entirely independent of the brain or body, then there is the possibility of a near, of near death experiences for which there is no measurable brain function. An example among others is Pam Robinson. I will quote from near death dot com, uh, the near death dot com website. Quote. When all of Pam's vital signs were stopped, the doctor turned on a surgical saw and began to cut through Pam's skull. While this was going on, Pam reported that she felt herself pop outside her body and hover above the operating table. Then she watched the doctors working on her lifeless body for a while. From her out-of-body position, she observed the doctor sawing into her skull with what looked to her like an electric toothbrush. Pam heard and reported later what the nurses in the operating room had said and exactly what was happening during the operation. At this time, every monitor attached to Pam's body registered no life whatsoever. At some point, Pam's consciousness floated out of the operating room and traveled down a tunnel which had a light at the end of it, where her deceased relatives and friends were waiting, including her long-dead grandmother. Pam's NDE ended when her deceased uncle led her back to her body for her to re-enter it. Pam compared the feeling of re-entering her dead body to plunging into a pool of ice, unquote. That is fascinating. Another incredible story centered around no brain function was published as the, stover, the cover story in the magazine Newsweek in 2012, which is an account by Eben Alexandra, MD. Dr. Alexandra's brain was attacked by rare form of meningitis in 2008. The part of the brain that controls thought and emotion shut down completely. Dr. Alexandra was in a deep coma for seven days. As his doctors weighed the possibility of stopping treatment, Alexandra's eyes popped open. Dr. Alexandra had taught at Harvard Medical School and was a neurosurgeon at Lynchburg General Hospital in Virginia, the hospital at which he received his treatment. From his experience, Dr. Alexander authored the book, Proof of Heaven, published in 2014, which was on the New York Times bestseller list for 97 weeks. Here's a quote from the Newsweek article. The message had three parts, and if I had to translate them into earthly language, I'd say they ran something like this. You are loved and cherished dearly forever. You have nothing to fear. There is nothing you can do wrong. The message flooded me with a vast and crazy sensation of relief. It was like being handed the rules to a game I'd been playing all my life without ever fully understanding it. We will show you many things here, the woman said again without actually using these words, but by driving their conceptual essence directly at me. But eventually you will go back. To this, I had only one question. Back where? I thought it was worth looking at the book a little more, a book that seemed to have been condemned by the scientific community, 
Here are two quotes from the book. Evil was necessary because without it, free will was impossible. And without free will, there could be no growth, no forward movement, no chance for us to become what God longed for us to be. Horrible and all-powerful as evil sometimes seemed to be in a world like ours, in the larger picture, love was overwhelmingly dominant and would be ultimately triumphant. Second quote, science, the science to which I devoted so much of my life, doesn't contradict what I learned up here. But far, far too many believe it does, because certain members of the scientific community who are pledged to the materialistic worldview have insisted again and again that science and spirituality cannot coexist. Here are two more quotes, and I quote, For all the successes of Western civilization, the world paid a dear price in terms of the most crucial component of existence, the human spirit. The shadow side of high technology, modern warfare, and thoughtless homicide and suicide, urban blight, ecological mayhem, cataclysmic climate change, polarization of economic resources is bad enough. Much worse, our focus on exponential progress in science and technology has left many of us relatively bereft in the realm of meaning and joy and of knowing how our lives fit into the grand scheme of existence for all of eternity. Second quote, to say that there is no chaos between our current scientific understanding of the universe and the truth as I saw is a considerable understatement. I still love physics and cosmology, still love our studying our vast and wonderful universe. Only I now have a greater and large conception of what vast and wonderful really mean. The physical side of the universe is as a speck of dust compared to the individual, invisible and spiritual part. In my past view, spiritual wasn't a word that I would have employed during a scientific conversation. Now I believe it is a word that we cannot afford to leave out. It appears that Dr. Alexander had no choice about returning. He was told he would go back. For Anita Mujani, there was a choice. Here's, here are some quotes from Anita regarding her experience from our website. Quote, I had end-stage cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma. I was being cared for at home. I was connected to an oxy oxygen tank and had a full-time nurse. But on this morning, February the 2nd, 2006, I did not wake up. I thought I was drifting in and out of consciousness during this time because I was aware of everything that was going on around me, but it was confirmed to me later by my family and the doctors that I was in a coma the whole time. I, I saw and heard the conversations between my husband and the doctors taking place outside my room, about 40 feet away down the hallway. I was later able to verify this conversation to my shocked husband. Then I actually crossed over to another dimension where I was engulfed in a total feeling of love. I also experienced extreme clarity of why I, I had the cancer. However, I made the choice of whether to come back into life or go towards death. I was made to understand that it was not my time, but I always had the choice, and if I chose death, I would not be experiencing a lot of the gifts that, my, that the rest of my life still held in store. At first, I did not want to come back because my body was very sick, and I did not want to come back into this body as the organs had already stopped functioning and I had all these open skin lesions. But if that seemed that almost but it seemed that almost immediately I became aware that if I chose life, my body would heal very quickly. I would see a difference in not months or weeks, but in days. Unquote. This certainly is an amazing story. Uh, Anita had numerous tumors on her on her upper body. This is an inspiring story for sure, but there's more to the story. Here is a further quote, and I quote, I then started to understand how illnesses start on an energetic level before they become physical. If I chose to go into life, the cancer would be gone from my energy and my physical body would catch up very quickly. I then understood that when people have medical treatments for illnesses, it rids the illness only from their body, but not from their energy, so the illness returns. I realized if I went back, it would be with a very healthy energy. Then the physical body would catch up to the energetic conditions very quickly and permanently. I seem to become aware that this applies to anything, not just illnesses, physical conditions, psychological conditions, etc. I became aware that everything going on in our lives was dependent on this energy around us, created by us. Nothing was real. We created our surroundings, our conditions, etc., depending on this energy was where this energy was. 
the clarity I felt around how we get what we do was phenomenal. It's all about where we are energetically. I somehow knew that I was going to see proof of this firsthand if I returned back to my body, end quote. In her book, Dying to Be Me, published in 2012, Anita states that overcoming cancer is not as simplistic as positive thinking and cannot be reduced to mind control. So far, the accounts of near-death experiences have been positive, but there are experiences that are not so positive. According to neardeath.com, around 19% of near-death experiences include a very unpleasant afterlife. This is very much in contrast to the accounts we have discussed so far. I don't think we have to go into great depth on what would be an unpleasant afterlife. Let's look at some available statistics, but overall an experience is likely to be positive rather than negative. Here are some surprising numbers from the Epoch Times website. 13 million Americans, or 5% of the nation's population, had experienced a near-death experience as of 1992, according to a 1992 Gallup poll. 774 near-death experiences per day are experienced in the United States, according to the same poll. A 1982 Gallup poll found that 15% of all Americans who had almost died under widely varying circumstances reported a near-death experience. About 9% reported the classic out-of-body experience. 11% said that they had entered another realm. 8% encountered spiritual beings and only 1% had negative experiences. In a 2005 study of American doctors, it was shown that 59% believe in some form of afterlife, a much higher percentage than it is found in other scientific professions. Yeah, the numbers for the total population are astonishing. Um, perhaps we have time to discuss some more examples of these experiences, but uh, I think we're going to have to do that uh, after the break. So why don't you take us into the break, Justina? Yes, after the break, we'll talk about another example of a near-death experience and talk a little bit more about near-death experiences and then go into the questions and the psychic insight. So please stay with us and we'll come back after the short break. Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the Exxon Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Welcome back to Too Good to Be True. And before the break, we were talking about near-death experiences. And Dad, you were just going to go into another example of a near-death experience. So can you please continue with this? Yes, this is another positive one. Uh, this is a quote uh, from a narrative made by a person called Lynn, who was just 13 years old at the time. And it's from neardeath.com. Uh, quote, from the light came two dogs of mine. One was a collie named Mimi, who had died three years previously from an infection. And the other was a boxer named Sam, who had died two years ago before after being hit by a car. The dogs came running and jumped on me and kissed, me, kissed my face with their tongues. Their tongues weren't wet, and I felt no weight when they jumped on me. The dogs seemed to glow from a light that was inside them. I recalled saying to myself, thank you, God, for letting my dogs be alive. I hugged my dogs as tight as I could. I then called my dogs and together we started walking toward the light. All colors were in the light and it was warm. A living thing and there were people as far as the eye could see. And they were glowing with an inner light, just like my dogs. In the distance I could see fields, hills and a sky. The light spoke and it said, Lynn, it is not time for you yet. Go back, child. Unquote. 
this is a great story. Uh, children apparently can have near-death experiences. Also, who doesn't want to be greeted by their pets? Here's a quote from the same website from an individual that overdosed on medication. It is a rather long quote, but mentions aspects of a soul's development. And I quote, At this point, they began trying to convince me to live my life. I knew it would be my decision, but perhaps that's because they knew all along I would choose to live. They showed me exactly how damaging my suicide would be and how much pain it would cause others. Not only people who knew and cared for me, but strangers. For instance, the sister of my father's co-worker, who would hear my story and grieve. They told me that my suicide would only pass my pain along to others, and that the sum of pain would actually be greater. They also told me that I would eventually have to go back anyway and live through all the traumas I'd already been through. It would be a little easier the second time around, since I'd already learned some of my lessons in this life. But wouldn't it be better just to go back now and finish what I started? Having just had my life reviewed, I was pretty horrified at the thought of having to go through my childhood again, and also the thought of causing others so much pain. But I told them that I just felt so exhausted and I needed to rest for a while. The angels understood completely, and I felt much love and sympathy from them. We discussed the life plan I had chosen, and I knew again that I had chosen a particularly difficult one for my current level of development. They were amused by my comment that I had been a little arrogant about what I could handle in one life. They assured me that others were involved in the decision and that I was really capable. They were like cheerleaders, encouraging me but loving me regardless of the outcome. They also told me that I was over halfway there, and I realized this was true, although I'm not exactly sure what that means anymore. That was the moment I chose life. Yeah, we now stumbled on several related topics, including reincarnation, life plan, and life review. We don't have time to go into much detail right now. You have read several books on the subject matter. Why don't you outline some of what you have read? Yes, the best-known book I've read, uh, Your Soul's Plan by Robert Schwartz, explores the premise that we're all, we are all eternal souls who plan our lives, including our greatest challenges. This is for the purpose of spiritual growth that we plan before we are born. But for a quick summary of these beliefs, the website Collective Evolution has an article by Nikki Gray from September 2014. I will quote from the article, which provides a lot of content. Quote, Throughout, through my research, the cycle of, of life to death to rebirth has been pretty much the same from all the sources I studied. And let me tell you, there are many. It all starts with a pre-birth plan. You establish this plan with a council. Some people call this council the elders or the wise ones. Pretty much they are very old beings who know their stuff, so to speak. You meet with them along with your spirit guides. You discuss the life ahead of you and you're given the choice of a few different lives to pick from in the current time period you are incarnating into. To give you an example, I was given the choice of being an artist or a samurai in Japan. You choose everything, including your parents. Once your choices have been given to you, you, go, you pick one. The tedious task starts of all the planning, all the start, things you wish to experience in the upcoming life. Experience isn't the only thing we seek. We have goals to meet and challenges to overcome. Some wish to learn patience or overcome jealousy. Many people have debated this theory, but you also choose to clear up karma. To, cl to me, clearing up karmas simply means creating a balance. There are a few other things like healing contrast and healing false beliefs. Now, the concept of karma is introduced into the discussion. Putting that aside for the moment, let's continue on the subject of life review. The website neardeath.com lists the purposes for life review based on accounts of near-death experiences. I will quote a few from the list. The life review is for educating us about ourselves, why we, why we are the way we are, what were our motives behind our actions, how did our lives impact others, how we could have done better, and what c can we do to correct aspects to ourselves which are not compatible with life on the other side. We learn these things in order to become a better person. The life review is for evaluating our soul development for the purpose of attaining soul growth. And finally, the life review is for evaluating our progress in completing our mission. The following is part of a list from the same website regarding lessons learned from a life review. 
Life is like a gigantic test, which we will grade ourselves on during the life review. Life reviews teach us who we really are. We are powerful spiritual beings. The more we learn in life, the more the doors of opportunity will be open to us later. We need negative experiences as well as positive experiences in life in order to learn. Before we can know joy, we must know sorrow. And we come to earth to make mistakes and have a human experience. The subject of reincarnation needs much more time to discuss. But reincarnation is a concept that a new life in a different physical body starts after each biological death. In terms of life plans and life review, if you believe in reincarnation, part of that belief may be that multiple lifetimes are necessary to progress spiritually. Karma is often associated with reincarnation. Karma means action, work, or deed. Good intent and good deeds contribute to good karma and future happiness, while bad intent and bad deed contribute to bad karma and future suffering. Karma, good or bad, apparently is said to be able to influence future lifetimes. Before we go to the psychic insight, why don't we go back to our first near-death experience that we discussed right at the beginning? You mentioned the experience described by Dr. Kathy Forti. What, we didn't mention the outcome. Here's a quote from the website, Rejuvenation and Restoration Technology. Quote, as strange as the experience was to fully understand at the time, over the next few years, it became a magnificent obsession to research and compile information on quantum physics, cellular regeneration, and many other related fields. All the while, she felt guided and directed every step of the way, receiving insights and inspiration on how to adapt the quantum physics applications in new and more powerful ways than anything that is currently available, unquote. For Kathy Forti, life has been pretty amazing, from psychology to quantum physics. Maybe you should start the questions for the psychic insight, and hopefully we'll receive some pretty amazing answers. Okay, I will ask the first question. We have discussed several different examples, but what are the purposes of near-death experiences? So near-death experiences can occur for a couple of different reasons. One is that they occur so someone can get a new start in life. So a lot of people who experience near-death experiences actually have a new outlook on life and they learn the lessons in their life quicker and it basically puts them back on track. So it's a kind of a hard love answer where is it, not, it is not their time to go, but this occurs. Number two, near-death experiences happen by mistake sometimes where you can say that something very negative happens to the person and is basically out of their control since other people decided to act on it. So this happens in situations such as when murders are attempted or someone does, not, does something dumb and gets in a car and hits someone. So this is not necessarily in their control. But again, in the end, it is on their life path. The third example is that with near-death experiences, it's actually based on their time to go almost. So this is hard to understand, but it's basically that they are not getting are getting close to death and that they decide if they want to live or if they want to decide if they no longer want to live. Can an exit point, uh, a point in a life plan where death may or may not occur, can that be a near-death experience? Yes. Why have near-death experiences only come to the public's attention since 1975? Because before this, people just really didn't discuss what was going on with them. So spirituality and all of that was not really in the public eye. Spirituality and the paranormal were a big taboo. So when people had near-death experiences, one, there wasn't the media and the more societal evidence of it, so that people did not really talk about it. Also, with near-death experiences, another thing is that you have to look at the science behind it that now there's more different scientific methods that are able to save people. So it is easier for people to go through extremes and still be able to survive. So this goes back to the life charts where technology and science changes, the life charts also change. So if you think about it in this way, before cars were invented, nobody could put into a life chart that they were going to be able to drive or that they would get in a car crash or that they would own a car. But once that came to society's presence, then people were able to put that in their life charts more. 
So not only the advancement of technology, but also the more spirituality and the more paranormal beliefs. Why do some near-death experiences apparently involve the choice of returning, while for others, returning has to occur? So if there is a choice, this means that this is on the person's life path to decide if they are ready to let go and go to the other side or if they want to stay and live. Other people have to return since it is not their time to die. So people cannot pass away until it is their time. So they have no choice. Even if they feel they want to go inwards, the white light, they still have to basically step back and go back into their bodies and into the present moment. Are some near-death experiences explainable by normal biological processes while others are not? Yes. So some near-death experiences that are reported are actually when people's minds shut down because of the pain they are experiencing. So this can include hallucinations and basically where their mind and body are not functioning. Another situation can occur. This is basically that they have to have this experience that they are very close to death and they are very aware of this and it is basically that they are looking at their bodies from outside of them. Is Sir Roger Penrose correct in suggesting, suggesting that humans have souls which don't, don't die along with their body? Yes. Is the grace and scale a good indicator if an experience has been near death or is not? Yes. Does the mind coexist, sorry, does the mind exist outside the brain such that the mind still functions when the brain is non-functional? Yes. Think we, you could uh, take us into the break, Justina. We've got one long question coming up. Yes, after the break, we'll continue with the questions and the psychic insight. So stay tuned for more information about the near-death experiences. Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the Exxon Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Welcome back to Too Good to Be True. And before the break, we are going through the questions and ha- answering them with the psychic insight. So, Dad, can you please continue on with the questions? Yes. Uh, the question we got to was, is one message from Eben Alexander's near-death experience true in that you are loved and have nothing to fear? Yes. And it goes back to the whole message that when someone dies, there's nothing really to fear anymore since they already got to the end. So there is this fear surrounding death and how when you die, it is something very unpleasant, which we are not denying that from the people living on this planet, it is very unpleasant from their perspective. 
but the people that actually pass on, it's not a horrible experience. So yes, there is sometimes pain and suffering, but once the death actually occurs, the people, the souls, the spirits, whatever you want to call them, no longer know what this pain feels like and have no recollection of the events except for the actual events. So basically the emotions and everything involved with that goes away. Is evil necessary in, a, in order to allow for free will? So are you saying that there has to be bad and good? Yes, from a comment from you and Alexander uh, regarding free will. Yes and no. There is a difference between true evil and people acting upon on their egos and as humans. So without evil, the place will still have conflict, since humans do naturally do go into conflict situations. So not necessarily evil, but just being human and living on the earth plane makes it so there is free will. Will good eventually overcome evil? What we can say is that good always does triumph over evil. Why does science have difficulty in coexisting with spirituality? So the problem is with science, everything has to be scientifically proven, obviously through the scientific method. So the problem with spirituality, it is more of a belief and a knowing instead of physically being there. So in science, things have to always be physically there. For example, in the human body, there's evidence, obviously, of the different organs, the cells, the DNA, the RNA, everything has physical evidence. However, since the soul is energy, it cannot be measured like normal energy, and it is said to not actually be there. So if there is a way to actually measure the soul in the energy it gives off, then it could be scientifically proven. Will Western civilization change to become more spiritual and less materialistic? So people will be more open to new things and combining both science and spirituality. So what we can say is that people are finally realizing that you don't only have to heal the body, it is also healing the mind, which obviously psychology and the whole study of the mind is a science. So people are becoming more aware of that. So the problem is in Western society, spirituality has kind of been rejected, while in more Eastern societies, it is actually embraced. So yes, there will be a change in how people basically treat the difference between being very scientifically driven, but also realizing that they can be spiritual at the same time. Is the physical side of the universe a speck of dust compared to the invisible and spiritual part of the universe? So yes, in the way, the more spiritual part is more, more something that people cannot even imagine, since there is so much going on there. So you can think of it kind of without endless boundaries, while the earth obviously has these boundaries. Why didn't even Alexander have a choice in having to return? Because it was in their life chart where they had to return and had to basically be able to share their experience with the world. It is obvious that both Dr. Bruce Grayson and Dr. Eben Alexander are both extremely well-educated people. Do they have a purpose in lending more credibility to spirituality through passing on their knowledge? Yes, and there are also other doctors working on healing in both mind and body. So when we say the mind, that includes spirituality. So yes, there are examples of people who are realizing that when someone needs medical attention, it's not just about the physical and the physical nature of their body, but also how they are treated and how they feel inside their mind. Why did Anita Mujani have a choice in returning or in passing away? So again, it was in her life chart to come back and to be able to not only share that experience, but enjoy life even more afterwards. How did Anita Mujani recover so quickly from being so severely ill? Because she had an optimistic, positive outlook at her getting better, and she received the treatment she needed. Approximately 19% of near-death experiences are not positive and can include nightmarish, nightmarish circumstances. Why is this? So usually in these types of circumstances is basically conquering fears. So it's very scary and a lot of people are scared of death. So it's conquering this fear of death. And also, again, this goes back to some people actually do have hallucinations when their body goes into shock. 
Do the beliefs of an ind- of an individual influence the near death experience in terms if it is positive or negative? Not really. No matter what, the near death experience will be whatever the person needs. So even if someone is very spiritual, they may have the unfortunate event of a negative experience. Are the numbers of five percent of the population in the United States as of nineteen ninety two having had near exper- near death experiences realistic? So if you include the people who have had things like sleep paralysis with basically their body and mind separating, then yes. So this w- so that would include what are considered on earth to be natural causes? Yes. Are suicide attempts a planned part of a person's life path as well as being unplanned? Yes and no. So for the most part, it is planned in their life path in some way. So the thing is that with suicide, it is one of the hardest deaths since losing your own life is very unfortunate since you're putting it into your own hands. So sometimes it's in the person's life chart and also in the people around them's life chart. But if you think about it, suicide actually influences the people around them more than the person once it actually happens. But it can also be done in the life chart in a different way where they don't really choose to do it but instead something in their life chart directly influences them to commit suicide. What's the near-death experience that changed the the life of Dr. Kathy Forty, part of her life plan? Yes. Was it necessary to have a near-death experience for Kathy Forty to become knowledgeable in advanced physics? Why didn't she just have that interest since birth? So when people have near-death experiences, It sometimes actually ends up so they can change their life path. So it ends up so they can learn new lessons and basically shift their interests. So it's not uncommon for people who have near-death experiences to actually change something about themselves. Is the general understanding in psychic literature of reincarnation, life planning, life review, and karma correct? So in general, for the general information, yes. What lessons should we take away from learning more about near-death experiences? Number one is to enjoy life. So people really don't enjoy life until they are close to not being able to live anymore. Number two, it's for the people to realize that even when they are going through something horrible, that in the end, after they do go to the other side, they are going to be in peace and out of pain. So it's comforting to know that anyone's loved ones do not feel this pain and are not currently feeling this pain but instead are at peace. Okay, that's the end of the questions. Um, Is the conclusion that some near-death experiences are explainable by science, while others can be only explained by spiritual belief too good to be true? That depends on what you are prepared to believe. Well, Justine, I was really surprised by all the mainstream information on the subject. Uh, I must have been uh, sleeping for several years because I was amazed at... uh, how much was in the national press and Newsweek and so forth. But anyway, um, why don't you talk about our Facebook page? Yes, so we have a Facebook page. And to find it, you can search in the search bar, Too Good To Be True. And that's spelled T-W-O, good, and then T-O, be true. So Too Good To Be True. And we would love if you come, like the page, follow us, interact with us on there. And provide any discussion, anything you want to say about this show, any other shows. And you can also find links to past shows there. So we would love to interact with the listeners. And of course, we're always thankful for the listeners. But just a quick point about the show is I think what really shocked me was that there was so many different doctors talking about near-death experiences. When I kind of imagine near-death experiences to be something more on the spiritual side and not really doctors talking about it. Yes, it seems to be uh, a hot topic uh, currently, um, back to those national papers in in the UK in particular and, and Newsweek. Um, what else I took away from it all was what a, what a positive uh, message. Um, we really don't have anything to fear if we believe the, the psychic insight. Um, we're here to learn and um, at the end of the day, uh, we'll leave and... Uh, We'll be at peace it's, and uh, even have our pets greet us. It uh, it's really is a positive message, I think. 
Well, and I think my favorite point from this whole thing is that coming from a more scientific background is that there's actually people trying to study this and try proof for the soul and proof that these near-death experiences occur. So with that background, it's very interesting for me to see people actually put things together like the Grayson scale where they're trying to find a scientific way to prove something that's not exactly physically in front of the people and can't be completely quote unquote proven. So I think that was interesting to see also. Yeah, I think um, I, I have to declare that I have worked as in scientific research and it's not easy. And uh, the scientific method was mentioned, but uh, getting uh, getting sufficient proof and publishing something that's going to be accepted by others, um, even when it gets through the peer review, is a huge challenge. And um, so I my hat's off to all scientists in the world, quite frankly. Well, again, before we go here, we just want to say go like our Facebook page, interact with us. We would love to hear from the listeners. And of course, as always, thank you to all the listeners. <laughs>